So uh, please ask questions uh, whenever they come up. Works a little better that way. Make sure that we're covering things that people are interested in talking about. And we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end as well. So um, I'm going to talk about well, you know, validation. Why, why would you care about validation? So we'll be talking about a few things to uh, indicate why that might be important. Uh, there's a bunch of really cool stuff that we're doing in the Linux kernel community, and a lot of other open source communities are doing similar things. But um, I think we'll see that in the future we're going to need more. And I'm going to talk about a few possible ways uh, that we'll be able to support this for concurrency. One thing is, is that uh, validation is very much not a one-size-fits-all one proposition. We always have had, and we probably always will have, one-off hacked-up scripts where you just kind of write the thing, it does its job, it probably has bugs, but if you didn't hit them when you ran it, that's fine, you're getting rid of it, and that's that. Um, at the other extreme, we've always had and probably always will have systems that require extreme validation. Mission-critical business applications, people get really upset if they lose that much money. You may have seen some signs of that in the past uh, five years or so. Uh, there's uh, high-volume consumer applications uh, where you might have a really low probability of failure, but if you're selling a million units, then having 10,000 of them fail may uh, have really bad effects on your business and your reputation and everything else. Uh, autonomous space exploration systems. Now, they're getting pretty good about this. They're actually able to upload code to Curiosity on Mars, which is kind of impressive. It's a bit of a long-distance phone call for your download. Or is it upload? I don't know. Uh, load some direction or another. But, you know, if uh, Curiosity isn't able to point its antenna in the right direction, you're done. I mean, if you get a bug in where it's pointing its antenna, you can't talk to it anymore, and, and that's that. So there's some parts of that that just have to be right. No ifs, ands, or buts. You need really extreme validation. And of course, there's any number of safety critical embedded systems, um, and you can lose lives if it fails. Um, and we had an example yesterday in the kernel uh, with the, uh, I believe it was Bain Harris was talking about pacemakers that might have security holes that uh, could be exploited to have the same effect, even if it was operating correctly. So uh, we need a pretty wide range. Uh, and one question might be how do you tell where you are? This is kind of a, a partial list of the things I've worked on over a long time. And I'm not going to go through them in detail, except to note that the number of users is rather low. All right, the biggest project for the first couple decades I was working on had 100 users. And with those projects, there wasn't a need for any really violent formal testing. Because the number of users were so low, they used the system in very set ways. And so pretty straightforward uh, simple tests sufficed. And that was particularly important in the uh, university housing system. That was on a timeshare system. Testing cost money. Using the computer at all cost money. And if you did too much testing, your customer got angry at you because it cost too much money. So uh, there, there are trade-offs. But uh, in the 1990s, I took on a different role. I went to work for a company called Sequent that did a uh, uh, database uh, server system, parallel one. And we had about up to about 6,000 sites. And it was doing mission critical things. Uh, it was used heavily by businesses, their quarter close, and, very, and sometimes their manufacturing depended on it. And suddenly, uh, we really needed a lot more formal stress and unit tests and also a lot of the heavy duty stress tests. We call it TLB tests rather than RCU torture, but it did the same thing plus a few other things. So part of it is just how many users you have. So going from two digits of users, less than 100 users, to about 10,000 users made a big difference in how I did testing. So what are we going to say about the Linux kernel right now, which over the time I've worked on it has risen from, it was at least a million users in 2000. I don't know how many. Uh, now, if you count the smartphones, if you count Android, it's got to be at least a billion. And so the question that this is looking at, and this that I'm looking at here, is what the heck do we do now? Going from uh, about 10,000 to about a billion is five orders of magnitude. And uh, that might possibly require some changes in the way we do validation, maybe. My philosophy has been kind of the same. You want to torture your code to the best of your ability. Because if you don't, it's going to torture you. And uh, it's pretty good at doing that. It's, uh, bugs have a tendency to pop up when you're wanting to do something else or wanting to be somewhere else or when you're 
not available and people can get upset. And this may sound kind of strange. It, it seems kind of mean. You're, you're torturing Tux there and beating him up. Uh, and that you know just doesn't feel right. On the other hand, uh, um, I've had Tux torture me a few times with a few bugs. And uh, we, we have heard in this conference a few other people have had similar experiences. And it's, it's uh, better to get it right to start with. Of course, testing has limits. Testing is great. Uh, I use quite a bit of testing myself, some pretty heavy-duty tests, I think, although you know, other people may want to do better. But you, know, you pass a stress test, and well, maybe you just got lucky. In fact, I had a recent example of this in RCU, where I had a bug that's been there for about five years. If you uh, use certain configuration parameters that were perfectly legal, RCU would just not work. And uh, you know, it wasn't anything subtle. It wasn't like the typical things I've had in the past, where you get maybe a failure or two in a 10-hour heavy-duty run. It was like failures per minute. Okay. And uh, um, I've blogged on it. But, if, but the thing is, is that if you, uh, and the problem I had was I had an error in my test scripts. And there were a bunch of situations I wasn't testing that I thought I was. So when I improved my test scripts, I found this bug. So uh, testing is useful. We need to do it. We need to continue to do it, to do it. But it has limits. And one of the limits we have, the, the general idea, what you're trying to do here, is to torture the code at least as much as the real world, as your user base is going to torture it. Because if you can put 10 times more stress on it than your users are aggregate, you got a pretty good chance it's going to work fairly well in the field. If you've got a billion instances running out there, it's really hard to torture your code more than those billion instances running in parallel are going to. All right. And so one question, which we'll get to in a little bit, is why is Linux working reasonably? Why is the Linux kernel working reasonably in, in all these different areas? I mean, it seems not like phones fall over all the time. Um, they seem to be working fairly well. I haven't seen people, I'm not sure what kind of screen of death you get on an Android phone, but I haven't seen a whole lot of people getting those. And the thing is, if you don't do that, if you don't put more stress on your code during validation than the real world puts on it, you are going to have bugs escape to the field. And to some extent, it's unavoidable. Nothing's perfect, and it's not going to be. Life is inherently imperfect. But we'd like to keep it down to a dull roar. And of course, some of those bugs will result in security exploits. Um, I don't know if anybody has managed to uh, do a security exploit based on an RCU bug, but you know, it's just a matter of time, right, before something shows up. On the other hand, one of the reasons we have been doing fairly well is the Linux kernel community does use some pretty heavy-duty validation. Um, it's, uh, of, the, of the projects I've worked on throughout my career, it's the one that takes validation the most seriously, um, even in some fairly uh, impressive uh, Mission critical things. So let's take, it's worth taking a look at what we're doing. And uh, this brings up the question, OK, we've got these billion instances. We don't, uh, you know, that's, that's doing a billion machine hours per hour. And we don't, as far as I know, we don't validate that heavily. You know, I don't know if anybody has a test farm that's doing a billion hours per hour of validation. Maybe there's one out there, but I haven't heard about it. And uh, it would probably be obvious. And we know that the size, I'm sorry? Isn't that called users? Well, uh, that is one way you can do it, is to just outsource your testing to your users. But um, I found that the, uh, my users aren't necessarily as respectful of my time and my other plans as, uh, as my test farm might be. <laughs> but th that is one approach. <laughs> uh, they tend to you know, run across a bug at some random time when I'm not necessarily prepared to deal with it, or not happy to deal with it, and, but you've got to deal with it, right? Anyway, um, the thing is that you might have a bug. Maybe have a bug in RCU that shows up every million years of runtime. Okay, a million years of runtime. So you run this thing, and if you run it for a million years, the bug might show up. Well, across a billion instances, that means that bug is showing up three times per day across the installed base. And I, I'm pretty proud of RCU torture, but I don't think it is good enough to catch million year bugs at this point. And some bugs do get through. We've, uh, you know, I've seen examples of them where I've managed to get. So mostly, I think it gets out to distro testing, but I'm sure there's some that have made it to the field. So why is this working? One reason is that the bulk of Linux's user base, Linux kernel's user base, has a very small number of CPUs. And uh, what happens 
is that we have big systems, a fair number of them, where we can catch uh, bugs that happen fairly often on larger systems, but on the, on the smaller systems that make up most of the installed base, they're much less probable. You know, the more CPUs you have, the greater the probability of a given uh, concurrency bug occurring, all else being equal, which of course it isn't, but there you are. Uh, unfortunately though, or maybe it's fortunately, but what is happening is these small embedded systems, their CPU counts are increasing. And that means that that advantage we've had, where we have big servers that have put a lot of concurrency stress on the system, and that protects a very large number of smaller systems that have less concurrency stress, that is deteriorating, that's going away with time. One thing that's happened with, yes? Uh, Isn't that only true if the number of um, CPUs in small systems is going up faster than the number of CPUs in your large system? So isn't that true only if the number of CPUs in the small systems is going up faster than the number of CPUs in large systems? Um, that's an interesting question, but it means the one thing is what's faster mean? Um, because the smaller systems are going from like one, two, four, eight. Um, and the larger systems may be doubling as well, but they're out further. Um, so, you know, maybe. Uh, you might be right. Um, I'm not quite that trusting. <laughs> but uh, I hope you're right and make my life easier, but I, I, I'm uh, unwilling to uh, uh, trust the luck quite that much. One thing that uh, also has helped in the past, especially for the embedded market, and there's a huge amount of the instances of the Linux kernel running in the world are embedded one way or another, TVs, smartphones, whatever. And the nice thing about that is you can run a system test for that device that exercises what that device does fairly thoroughly. And in, when it's out in the field, it doesn't do much else, and therefore the bugs that are available are very likely to be found in that fairly restricted test. And that's wonderful, except that these embedded devices over time are becoming general purpose. I mean, you've probably seen internet uh, posts about uh, the smartphone being the new desktop. Well, if it's going to be the new desktop, that means it has the desktop variety of workload, and suddenly a restricted system test isn't going to be as effective at finding problems. Fortunately, one of the nice things about the kernel community is there's a lot of tools, testing, and validation going on. So it's worth, the, yeah. Or, Talking about scaling CPUs, the big systems generally aren't ARM CPUs and the phones are generally ARMs. Mm -hmm. Does that have much impact on the, um, what you can learn? So uh, the question was, uh, the big systems tend not to be ARM and the little systems tend to be ARM. And uh, you know, is there a, does that make it a little more difficult to learn, take your learnings from the big system and apply it to the little systems? And clearly there are some limitations. The big systems aren't exercising arch ARM very much. Um, and so whatever bugs are there are going to have to be found within the confines of ARM. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, core kernel code that, um, that's, fairly, that's uh, fairly aggressively parallel. And that gets shaken out pretty heavily by the larger systems. But yes, you're right. It's, uh, there are parts of it that, uh, that do change as you go down to the smaller end. So it's worth taking a quick look at some of the testing and tooling that is, that is helping. Uh, one thing, of course, is code review. The old thing about uh, all bugs being shallow to 10,000 lines eyes. All bugs being shallow to 10,000 eyes. Uh, that's fine, except I'm not sure the review has really kept pace with the change rate and the complexity. From uh, 311 to 312, there were over 8,000 files changed, half a million insertions, and a quarter million lines deleted. So if we were going to have a 10,000 eyes on each line of code, uh, well, half a million times 10,000 divided by however many lines somebody can review in a few months, um, I don't think we have that many people doing reviews. But still, uh, code review is very important, and there have been a lot of very subtle bugs that have been found and fixed because of review. It's something we need to keep. It's just that it can't be the only validation thing we're using. We have to have other things as well. And the good news is we do have other things. There's unit and stress tests are becoming more common in the kernel. I'm, of course, proud of RCU torture, but there's lock tests, kernel bench, hack bench, and so on. Linux test project, uh, Dave Jones Trinity has been quite effective in the last couple of years, finding all sorts of interesting bugs by uh, intelligently fuzzing the system call layer, uh, by randomly generating system calls, but with some intelligence based on what other system calls happened more recently to uh, force code paths that uh, make sense. There's also automated or recurring tests. Stephen Rothwell's Dash Next testing has been around for a while, and it's, uh, I think it's done a really good job of doing integration testing for the 
for the uh, stuff that's going to go in the next merge window. Feng Guangwu's cave test build robot is uh, something that does individual tests, and uh, it's been very helpful to me. And of course, there's just a lot of other testing going on. Um, there are some tools that have been helpful. Sparse is one. Lockdep has been extremely helpful over the past uh, five, ten years in finding lock, um, deadlocks and so on. And I think we need to uh, really give a big thank you to everybody who's been helping with this. There's been a huge amount of work, and a lot of this has been helping uh, allow the Linux kernel to work well, despite this uh, mismatch in the testing versus the installed base. And for those who haven't seen it, this is kind of what, uh, if you if you push a uh, change out, push a, a commit out, and uh, there's a problem with it, you'll get an email automatically like this. In this case, I hadn't uh, tested a certain configuration, and I got a build error out of it, so he complains about it. And furthermore, uh, one thing that's nice more recently is he actually flags which line of code has the problem. So it makes it kind of nice. You don't have to go check, find it, check it out, and, and go look for the thing. You can just look at that and see what's going on. So all those, thing, all those things are very helpful, but... Um, Things are likely to get more vicious in the future. Um, it might be that uh, CPU counts have increased as far as they are, and they're not going to increase farther, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that would be a surprise to me if that happened. And uh, that includes the low-end systems, that uh, many of which are single CPU or a very small number of CPUs that will be increasing in, in uh, scale. The other thing is that as the larger CPUs get bigger, we'll have to use more of the aggressive scalability techniques. And uh, that, means, that means going away in some cases from strict locking. Um, and the problem is things like LockDep don't help much with atomic operations or memory barriers being, being misplaced. Right now, that sort of inspection is manual. Now, perhaps we can in, improve the tools to check for that, and, and I'll talk about some possibilities later on, but um, uh, and just manual inspection is wonderful, but it doesn't scale. So we need some way of automatically checking for these things, possibly extending lock depth, which it has been extended. It now checks the various things in RCU and so on, for example. And uh, of course, there's a lot of other needs besides just concurrency, like validation of standards, to say nothing of validations of standards themselves. But um, because I know about concurrency, I'll focus on concurrency for this presentation. So one way of looking at this, uh, what, what I've been doing is not just looking at the failures that hit the field, but also the near misses. And this is kind of by analogy with airplane safety. They don't wait until airplanes actually crash before they complain. And in the Linux kernel, we need to take the same strategy. And we have. Locked up, for example, doesn't wait for a deadlock before it complains. Instead, it waits until the conditions are set up that says, geez, there's these locks, and they're acquired out of order. Therefore, there could potentially be a deadlock, and then it complains. <clears throat> so um, some near misses. One was a RC CPU stall warning bug. Um, it was a shortcoming of my development uh, methods. The way this works, what it's doing, is that if a CPU does something like spin with interrupts disabled for like 21 seconds, okay, which is a long time to have interrupts disabled, <laughs> <laughs> This, this does happen from time to time, okay? I mean, it's, um, then uh, RCU complains and says, you know, that CPU is not talking to me. Uh, you know, maybe you need to take a look at it. And the thing is, 21 seconds is a long time. I mean, you know, you, I shouldn't have to be dainty about checking for something that's taking 21 seconds. I've spent the last two or three years learning how wrong that statement is. I don't care if it's 21 seconds. I have to be just as careful with checking for RCU CPU stall warnings as I do for the core CPU grace period mechanism. Um, uh, in early days, I was fooled by the fact that it was not on by default, and so there were relatively few of them. Uh, since it got turned on by default, uh, they show up all over the place, and uh, uh, what that did was suddenly increase my user base from a few tens of people who cared to the entire user community, uh, you know, as Robert pointed out earlier. And uh, I got a little bit of an education in the variety of things that could happen and what you had to do to make sure that you were giving useful information when the CPU stalled. Another near miss uh, was caught by mainline testing. Uh, this was uh, a fun, exciting one in uh, 3.0 RC7 with a race between uh, RCU, the interrupts, and the scheduler. 
And uh, the problem was is that I had allowed RCU to become more entwined than it had to be with the rest of the kernel, which meant that small changes in other parts of the kernel had an outsized effect on me. And one of the things that I need to continue going forward is to make sure we maintain modularity so that we can avoid this sort of thing. Uh, there was a day one RCU initialization race I caught last year, which I'll show on the next slide. But uh, I should say that um, actually day one is kind of a slippery concept in RCU. If I want to be pedantic, I can actually say that I've eliminated all RCU day one bugs, guaranteed. You see if you diff against, uh, say, 2612, there are three classes of statements still left. One of them is preprocessor directives, like self-excluding include files. The second one is comments, like the GPL header comment. The third one, blank lines. Very good. <laughs> so there are no day one bugs in RCU, uh, so I decided I better change the definition to be like when I first added that code as opposed to back from 2612, since that's kind of meaningless. This is an initialization race I found in late uh, 2012. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Um, the slides will be up so you can look at it uh, if you want to and go look at the commits. Uh, the point I'll make is it takes three CPUs to make this happen, and not just any CPUs. There have, they have to be, at least two of them have to be in different sets of 16 CPUs. If you have less than CP, 16 CPUs, see, if you have 16 CPUs or less, this can't possibly happen. And you have to have three or four things, three or four fairly rare things happen sort of at the same time, just, just wrong to make this happen. And uh, this, as far as I know, hasn't happened in the field. The reason I found it was I made a change that made it much more probable, and then it started showing up all over the place. Now, there, I do have guys that review RCU, and they're really, really smart guys. Very impressive. But I, I can't expect them to find this. And that's, that's asking a bit much, I'm afraid. I didn't see it until it whacked me over the head. So we need something to help with this sort of thing, because these sorts of problems will be showing up. So it's hard to say exactly how we'll do this. I'm, what I'm going to be talking about right now is kind of speculative. Um, there's a little bit of this I've done in the past, actually going back 20 years. But uh, uh, there's some work that might make it more useful or might not. But it seemed worth taking a look at and, and chasing down. And I'll be working on it some more going forward. One of the problems we've had with formal verification is that a lot of the formal verification guys had a very strange notion of what their job was and what systems did. So the traditional formal validation means that you validate all the behaviors of the entire system. And that means you need a description of all the behaviors of the entire system. And that description tends to be about as big as the system itself, and just as likely to have bugs as the system itself. And uh, also, this is very slow. They've actually done this for a non-trivial, well, sort of non-trivial system, uh, the L4 microkernel, which is about 10,000 lines of code, roughly. And the way they did that is they took a very large number of Russian PhD students, taught them Isabel, which is a validation language, and uh, locked them in rooms and made them beat up on this. And on a very good day, they might get 25 or 30 lines validated. But that would be a very unusually good day. So this takes a huge investment of time and effort. Um, and it's not really feasible for 15 million lines of Linux kernel code. Yes? Yeah, L4, uh, the, the comment was that L4 is pretty basic. And yeah, it's, it's not, I don't, I don't think it's multiprocessor even. Maybe it is. Uh, but, but yes, it's not, um, and it's not 15 million lines of code either. <laughs> it doesn't run on 1,000 CPU systems. Uh, so yeah, so this, this is uh, something that's interesting for very small pieces of code. I'm sure that people will keep doing it, but it's not something we can apply to the entire Linux kernel. Uh, they also want to assume strong ordering, and uh, uh, by their definition of strong ordering, x86 is weakly ordered. Um, uh, x86, if you do a store followed by a load, it can interchange them. And when they say strong ordering, they mean you don't do that. Unfortunately, uh, if you make that restriction, your CPU runs very slowly. So most manufacturers want to have the store buffer optimization that allows that interchange to happen. And so we do not have strong ordering on any commercial CPU by the formal methods guy's definition. They also tend to want special purpose languages. And uh, that's unfortunate because most parallel code is in general purpose languages like C in the case of Linux kernel or C++ and, and other things. So 
Um, I was actually getting pretty, uh, uh, kind of a negative attitude towards the formal validation guys until a couple years ago. I was at a workshop and a guy named Richard Bornat, who's been in the formal validation since the 60s, uh, emeritus guy, he's a prof in the UK. And he got up in front of a bunch of people and said, our job is to validate the code the developers write in the environment they write it in and in the language they write it, which I thought was pretty cool. And he's uh, actually done some work with that. <clears throat> um, he and a bunch of students took and uh, wrote a, a tool that generates pre and post conditions given C code. And they dumped the Linux kernel through it and were able to do that for about a million lines of the Linux kernel. Now I have no idea what I would do with a million lines of pre and post condition, but the fact that they were willing to do something like that on a code base like the Linux kernel is actually a really nice change. And a number of researchers have been taking this to heart, a very small fraction of the total, but still a fairly large number. And I'm gonna talk uh, really quickly about what some of them have been doing and how that might in the future, I mean, the stuff is mostly not ready for prime time, but might in the future help us out. Uh, this one's been around for a while. I did a uh, elevator article um, a couple years ago on it. And what you can do with it is you can take short assembly language sequences you have multiple processors, so you know, processor zero does a store, processor one does a store, processor two reads those two things in one order, and processor three in the other order, and you give an assertion down there. And this tool will do a full state space search. It will go knowing the semantics of that processor, in this case power, they also do ARM, and I think the C, C++11 <coughs> is another one that they do. And it will look at anything that those CPUs might do and tell you whether or not that assertion will trigger in any of those situations, which is uh, useful when you're trying to, if you're trying to work a very small piece of a parallel algorithm and make sure it works. The nice thing is you can get definitive answers for some of these things. I mean, in the past, what you had to do is stare at the books, uh, ask architects, and maybe you knew and maybe you didn't, and it took months. In this case, um, you can actually run it and see what happens. And it's actually a pretty, for, especially for research code, it's actually pretty good. It seems to be near production quality in terms of, of what it does. It does have some shortcomings. It deals with assembly. You have to translate that. It does not handle arbitrary loops or arrays. Uh, very small code sequences of limited application, and it takes a while. Now, that example I showed on the previous slide takes 14 CPU hours and about 10 gigabytes of state space on a fairly recent x86 processor. So it's... Uh, uh, does chew up a little bit of, of time. If you, this was a, the one I showed was one that worked, so it had to do a lot of validation. Failures can be detected more quickly. Um, and it's not, it's not perfect, but it's actually a really cool milestone in real world parallelism. It's a case of some academics actually saying, okay, what do the real world programs have to develop, deal with, and how can we help them with that? And that's a really nice change from pre pro previous projects. Of course, um, you know, you're not gonna dump the whole Linux kernel through that. But still, if you have a very short sequence of code you need to do some specific interchange or some specific synchronization, this can help with it. Another uh, approach is uh, something that's pursued by uh, Algolay, Kroning, and uh, Chashnig. The thing is, is that uh, programming language writers are very proud of the fact that their language is Turing complete. But the fact is, if you're running an any real system, it's a finite state machine. Now, in fact, the universe seems to be a finite state machine, so you know, you're, there's some limits you have there. And the thing is, is that a finite state machine can be represented by a logic expression. And if you have an assertion in that, you can use a SAT solver to determine whether or not that chunk of code that got turned into a logic expression will ever trigger. Now, SAT is NP-complete. Uh, means that its run times get very large, increase exponentially with the size of the problem. On the other hand, full state state search is no picnic either. Um, it's, if anything, worse. And there's been a huge amount of progress on SAT over the past 20 years. 20 years ago, the state of the art was, a, was an expression that had 100 variables in it. And that was just barely possible. And within the last little while, they've gotten to where they deal with million variable problems. If you're talking about a million variable problem, that means you might actually handle tens or even hundreds of lines of code. So, you know, this, uh, this is very new. The papers on this were published like last year. And of course, they've got tools, they're publicly available, which is really cool, except that this research code, they did just enough to make their, publish the paper. Um, and there's a lot of work to go beyond that, but still, it's an interesting start. 
I'm not going to go through this in massive detail, um, but the basic thing is you might have a little code snippet like up in there where CPU1 assigns 1 to X and then 2 to X, and CPU1 just reads X. And what you can do is turn that into a logic expression uh, that describes what could happen there. And, I'm, and again, I'll just go ahead and uh, look at what, you might, what it might look like, which is this mess down here. And a reasonable question to ask at this point is, how the heck is this supposed to make things simpler? And obviously, it's, um, I, mean, I, I can understand that a lot easier than I understand that. But the neat thing is, I don't have to understand that to make, for it to be useful. There's a lot of software out there to analyze these expressions, and uh, the hardware guys have been doing validation using this kind of stuff for a long time. And they can all simplify and manipulate them. And the nice thing is they can generate them directly and automatically from C code. You can take C code and feed it to one of these things, and it'll go and do this stuff and, uh, and also solve it. And that's, of course, a good thing, because doing this by hand would be totally impossible. Yes? Am I sure there's no bugs in the software analyzing these expressions? Well, as you'll see in a couple of slides, I know really, really well there are bugs. <laughs> it's research code. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that's actually been around for a long time, but only deals with sequential code, is something called CBMC, the C-bounded model checker. And uh, it takes uh, small C programs as input and uh, does array balance checking and also checks for assertions automatically. Um, again, it doesn't handle, a lot of, doesn't handle a lot of threading, but it's a place to start. And it's actually, this is actually fairly reliable. It seems to work pretty well. So I had to write a little program to check it out. A um, little program reads this, takes an argument, multiplies it by 2 and adds 1. Uh, the result is guaranteed to be odd, and then it uh, has an assertion saying, yes, it's odd. And uh, to validate this with CBMC, you just go CBMC even dot C. Just give it the C file, and it goes through, does all this stuff, and at the bottom it says verification successful after 17 milliseconds, which, you know, not bad. Of course, uh, to Matthew's point, um, how do you know you can trust your software that's doing this analysis? And one way, of course, is to hand it a bad program and see if it finds the bug. Okay, well, you know, that's easy in this case. We just remove that plus one there, so we say we multiply I by two so it's guaranteed even, and then we assert that it's odd. And, uh, you know, if the software's working, it should yell us about that, right? And sure enough, it does. It says verification failed at the bottom. Um, I didn't show it all. It actually gives a trace, and, which, is, which I was really impressed with. It actually works backwards from the logic expression of the C code and tells you what lines of C code various things happened on for the bad thing to happen, which could be helpful. And uh, just to be obnoxious, I had to do Fermat's last theorem. Um, and uh, <laughs> you check the bounds to make sure it won't overflow, and then you assert that a, a cubed plus b cubed not equals c cubed. This one took a little bit longer. It took, it took almost three minutes to <laughs> validate. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, you, you, you could have actually exhaustively run the thing a lot faster than that, but then it would have taken me more than three minutes to write the program and make sure you get all the bugs out of it. So I guess this was a win. Um, the reason it was so slow is that uh, I had multiplication in there, and SAT solvers deal with Boolean variables. So the logic expression had a logic equivalent of a hardware multiplier in it, <laughs> and a hardware adder, and a hardware comparison. So, so that's why it had uh, 24,573 variables and uh, 29,508 clauses in the logic expression it was analyzing, all right? So yes, if I had had to do that massive logic expression myself, it'd been hopeless. But it seemed to do just fine with it. And uh, you know, uh, if given that big, I, I can forgive it taking three minutes to figure that out. So, you know, this, this looks like it has some promise, but of course this is still only sequential. Uh, this is kind of a summary of where you can get it, and it's got a really nice documentation and what it does. But uh, how about multi-threaded, right? Well, it turns out these guys have uh, produced a prototype, and I mean prototype in the, uh, I mean prototype, I'm telling you. <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, it uh, does the memory model, and it actually does ordering and does various constraints and single assignment. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's scripted fairly easily down there. Um, and I came, became aware of this. I was uh, at a workshop in Rome, 
And uh, this guy gets up and says he's doing this thing to check memory order. I'm going to go, okay, that's whatever. And then he told me what the, uh, his test workload was for it, which got my attention. He said he was using, as a, he was said he was using the Linux kernel RCU implementation as his <laughs> test thing. So of course, at that point, I asked him if he found any bugs, at which point he started explaining RCU to me. <laughs> And I, I, I respond, he say X, Y, Z about RCU, and I say, okay, ABC too. And we did that a few rounds, and eventually it was clear that I wasn't getting across and I already knew it. So I said, you know, just, in, just so you know, I'm the Linux kernel RCU maintainer. <laughs> At which point he said, oh, I guess I don't need to explain it to you then. <laughs> Although sometimes I think I could use an explanation, but hey. <laughs> anyway, what these guys do, what, what they're able to do is they actually expand the logic expression to cover multiple threads, and you have, to, you have to kind of include your program. This is the same program I had in assembly language before. The yellow stuff is the code under test, the white stuff is the stuff you have to put there to make it do what it needs to do. So I've got, X, I've got a variable I'm setting to one, variable Y I'm setting to one, they both start out zero. I load in one order, I load in the other order. The unbuffered stuff is stuff that is uh, not actually validated by the machine, it's just there to, for the assertion. And uh, I guess it's not going to help to look at the other screen. I have to actually advance to the next slide. Uh, I have my assertion there saying that what I, what I expect not to be able to happen. And it does just fine. And the cool thing is, is it takes two CPU seconds instead of 14 CPU hours. And it takes maybe 10 megabytes or thereabouts. I couldn't really tell instead of 10 gigabytes. So this is a really nice performance enhancement uh, compared to the to the old uh, sequen uh, state space search approach. So that's good. Um, this is where you can get it from, uh, how it handles it. It has the same thing that doesn't handle general loops. However, you can give it a parameter saying unroll your loops to like five, and it'll, it'll go there. The problem with unrolling loops, with it doing loops generally, is that you end up with an infinite logic expression which the machines don't like to handle. So I just happen to have some new RCU code. Uh, the, it's the cover John wrote an article on is the whole system idle and uh, it's, we've done a bunch of testing on it and also some review but you know why not try this out why not just try this stuff and see what happens unfortunately that happens <laughs> <laughs> it's quite possible 685 lines was too much so I sent a bug report in and they found something or another and uh, maybe I'll get a fix at some point but uh, they've got another tool called Impara um, it's very similar I mean it takes a, pretty much the same source code uh, with different flags. Uh, first thing I found out is it doesn't like dynamic memory allocation. It yells at you on every malloc. Um, there's a bug fix for that apparently in the works. But I can, I can just make my use static allocation and just assign pointers. And it didn't like that either. Uh, so I may have to fall back to promo and spin for this one. Um, on the other hand, it did just fine with all of the memory ordering litmus tests that were, you know, the just if you have just pairs of variables and you do with them, it did just fine on all of those. So at the, at the moment, it's a matter of finding out what it can handle. Um, and uh, in the meantime, for the larger things, I may have to do problem and spin. But the really cool thing about this is if you can handle C code, I can imagine taking parts of RCU and putting comments in there that are to be automatically recognized. I have a script that yanks the stuff out, throws it into the thing, and just does the validation as part of just normal testing. And that'd be really cool. And that might be possible in three to five years. This stuff is pretty raw. The paper was just published this last year. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that has to do to get it to where it's going to be production ready for that sort of a thing. But the fact it can do what it does is a really, really nice change for what's happened, what we've been getting from the formal validation guys in the past. So um, validation in the Linux kernel has been increasingly challenging. That's likely to keep going for a bunch of reasons. Uh, the Linux kernel community has done a really good job of rising the challenge, but the hill is still growing and we have to climb it. And this, these are some possible tools that perhaps might help us out in the future. And uh, I think they'll handle larger problems than uh, some of the other things have before, but uh, time will tell. I'll still be playing around with it and giving a hard time to the authors when things break. This page is always uh, sponsored by IBM Legal. And if you have more questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yes? Is it a highly parallelized 
So the question was, uh, this thing that uh, took 14 CPU hours, is it parallelizable? Can we, uh, can we throw more CPUs at it and make it go faster? Uh, potentially. Um, right now, it's sequential. The implementation is sequential. Um, and if you, if you could somehow work out what part, you split the state space up, you could go in parallel. Uh, Promola has some features to allow parallelism, um, but um, you pay a price for that because suddenly you have to do, introduce locking and other overheads, and uh, uh, you may get a win, you may not. Uh, the key thing is that you might, maybe if you use 1,000 CPUs, you get 1,000 times speed up, but I got like something like 10 or 10,000 times speed up by using a different algorithm. So, you know, um, I think we'll end up having to do both at some point. But yeah, um, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of work and performance is going to be part of it. Time for one more question before we wrap up. If not, uh, thank you for uh, joining me in thanking Dr. Palmer. Thank you.